heippa kaikille siellä kotona tai missä ikinä nyt mahdattekin olla. Tänään puhutaan kirjasopassa Annette Hessiltä, joka on kohta tulossa meidän vieraaksemme tänne kirjasoppaan. Ää, tulkki, tämä kirja on yksi ehdottomasti kirjavuoden suosittaja niin tänään. Kirjasoppaa en valitettavasti ole ehtinyt tänä syksynä hirvittävästi tekemään. On ollut niin hirvittävän hoppu, mutta nyt kun lähestytään joulua ja ennen kaikkea te varmasti alatte miettiä joululahjakirjoja tai että mitä oikein joulua luetaan, niin aletaan puhua kuitenkin hieman enemmän siis kirjoista. Eli kirjasoppaa on tiedossa nyt joulun lähestyessä hieman enemmänkin. Mutta muutama sana tästä Annette Hessin mahtavasta romaanista Pirkko Roinilan hienona suomennoksena. Äh, Annette Hess on käsikirjoittaja ja romaanikirjailija. Tämä on hänen esikoisromaaninsa ja se on ehdottomasti Auschwitz-kirjallisuuden kärkeä. Äh, tämä on tarina Eva Brynssistä, joka on ammatiltaan tulkki ja hän Joutuu hieman sattuman kautta tulkiksi Auschwitz-oikeudenkäynteihin 60-luvun alkupuolella. Tämä kirja on poikkeuksellisen kielellisesti. Ensin en oikein tiennyt, että miten suhtautua tähän kieleen, joka on sillä tavalla kumman tukahtunut ilmaisultaan. Mutta sitten se tukahtuneisuus alkaa viedä mukanaan, eikä kirjaa kerta kaikkiaan voi lopettaa lukemasta. Henkilöt ovat kiinnostavia, mutta myöskin ajankohta. Tämä siis sijoittuu 60-luvun alkuun ja auschwitz on paljon. Saksassa kirjoitetaan paljon kirjoja lähimenneisyydestä, mutta tämä ajankohta ja se, että millainen maailma silloin oli, tekee tästä kuitenkin myöskin aiheen käsittelyssään poikkeuksellisen, sillä 60-luvulla nämä ihmiset Kaikilla heillä on siis jonkinlainen henkilökohtainen kokemuspinta ylipäänsä kansallissosialismista. Heillä on omakohtaisia muistoja tietenkin sodasta. Ja kaikki elävät suuressa kieltämisen ilmapiirissä on salaisuuksia. Ja myöskin sitten mietitään vähän, että miten siihen lähimenneisyyteen oikein pitäisi suhtautua. Ja tietenkin siis kansallissosialisteilla on myöskin yhä kannattajia. Ja tässä moni Kauschwitz-kirja käsittelee no, siis sotavuosia tai sitten esimerkiksi sitä, että miten sitten myöhemmät sukupolvet ovat, ovat alkaneet tutkia asioita tai löytäneet uusia asioita tai muuta tällaista. Mutta 60-luvulla sodasta on vain parikymmentä vuotta. Ja Eva Blunys Auschwitz-oikeudenkäyntien tulkki kuulee itse asiassa juuri näissä oikeudenkäynneissä ensimmäistä kertaa Auschwitzista. Ää, ja samaan aikaan tämä on myöskin ää, aikuisuuteen kasvavan Evan, Evan tarina. Ää, en, en aio antaa spoilereita tästä jännittävästä tarinasta, mutta se kieli oli siis tosiaan se, joka minua alkoi siinä kiinnostaa heti ensimmäisenä, koska se tukahtunut ilmapiiri tulee ilmi kielessä, vaikka en itse asiassa vielä tiedä, että miten tässä tulee käymään tai mistä itse asiassa on kyse. Se tukahtuneisuus siis heijastelee tämän päähenkilön omaa elämää myöskin ja ylipäänsä sitä ilmapiiriä. Ja toinen kiinnostava asia, jos siellä kotisohvilla on ihmisiä, jotka ovat kiinnostuneita kirjoittamisesta, niin kannattaa seurata sitä, että kuinka hienosti Annette Hess kuljettaa värisymboliikkaa tässä kirjassa. Sillä kuten tässä nyt otsikkokin näkyy, kirjan nimi näkyy kirjan kannessa, on keltaisella ja keltaista väriä kuljetetaan hyvin taitavasti. Eli tavoin myöskin vihreä ja punainen oranssikin vilahtaa siellä. Se, ne ovat tavallaan tällaisia moraalisia liikennevaloja ää, tässä ää, tarinassa, jossa ihmiset ää, 
yrittävät ymmärtää, mistä heidän lähimenneisyys, mitä siellä oikeastaan on tapahtunut ja ää, miltä, se, ää, miltä se näyttää. Kaikilla on jonkinlaisia salaisuuksia, eli tämä on myöskin salaisuuksien ää, romaani. Ää, ja ää, myöskin ää, sellainen ää, romaani, joka No, aihe on tietenkin tärkeä, mutta siis kokemuks, lukukokemuksena oli hyvin, hyvin vahva. Se sijoittuu uh, oikeudenkäyntiin tietenkin, mutta myöskin ravintolaan. Ja uh, sillä tämä uh, Eeva on ravintoloitsijan tytär. Eli siinä mielessä, siinä mielessä tullaan myöskin, uh, tuodaan esille paljon arkielämää. Ja uh, siitä arkielämänkin tutkimisesta haluan kohta kysyä Eeva kysyä kirjailija Hessiltä. And now I'll switch to English because we are about to um, um, we are about to have an interesting conversation with the author Annette Hess who has written this exquisite novel uh, in Finnish it's uh, Tulkki Interpreter uh, that the original title is Deutsches Haus, the German house in English, if you prefer to buy the book in some other uh, language. Um, I al already gave a short uh, introduction to the topic uh, in Finnish, and now we are going to have a conversation in English with Annette Hess. I'm hoping that she's there somewhere uh, about to join us. So Annette, if you are there, please do do join us um this is definitely um um perhaps one of the best uh books i i've, I've read about outreach um for, for many different reasons uh, of course the language itself is uh is uh absolutely uh stunning um but also um because uh because of the okay yes yes there she is no no, no. finally <laughs> <Hello. laughs> we had these technical problems the technical okay. problems i'm i'm um but now we are here I'm so super happy that you could join me for my literary kitchen and thank you for writing this excellent novel. Um, thank you. I already told the um, audience uh, in Finnish a few words about uh, the novel and, um, and also that it's set in a restaurant. And as my literary uh, Corona Kitchen is connected with kitchen and books. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering uh, if you are one of those authors who are also preparing the dishes you are writing about. No, I'm not because I'm not. A, no, I'm a vegetarian and there's a lot of meat in this. Okay, oh, that's house, so. interesting. Yeah. Because anyway, there's snitchel in the novel, but you haven't uh, you haven't prepared a snitchel yourself. Uh, yes, yeah. when I was 20 years old. Perhaps. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, 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 then, but uh, not while you were writing uh, no. the novel. Okay. Uh, so, um, me again, I'm one of those authors who actually are preparing the dishes I'm writing about. So, uh, that's why I was asking. I was, I was asking about that. Um, when you think about uh, your background research uh, and how you do your background research for the everyday life well you don't cook but uh, what kind of methods do you have um, for example the behavior of the people i was wondering because uh, your everyday life description in the novel is really good like you are not only saying what people are wearing but you actually know how they behave with those clothes. For example, you are uh, writing about men's hats and the young people, I think nowadays, I'm not sure if they know how, me when men, for example, took their hat off. 
Yeah, that's very important to describe yeah. this um, this time, special time. And um, I remember my grandparents, for example. They are born 1903. Yeah. They were born 1903, and um, their behavior in the 17, 70s, when I uh, was awake for the behavior, was the same as they behaved in yeah. the 50s. So I know how people acted. And uh, I wrote also a series for German TV about mm -hmm. the 50s, for example. And when I uh, first uh, came to the set, the actors uh, and, uh, were uh, touching each other all the time and kissing. And I said, no, in the 50s, uh, even in the families, they didn't yeah. kiss each other. They gave, shake, shook hands. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember that from my grandparents. So how okay, well that example. that uh, that uh, gave me the um, the uh, yeah. This is why we have to talk to older people. I think they they know so much about the past. Um, you have written uh, the uh, TV show by by Sense and then Pudam, which I don't think we have seen in, in Finland. Um, What's the difference between writing a script and, and writing a novel? Um, at first, it's the same. For me, it's the same because yeah. I'm building a plot. I did this uh, for uh, my novel too, and thinking a lot about the characters and about the ending and so, and uh, that was the same. But the writing process w were totally different because if you write a screenplay, there are a lot of creatives doing their own creative stuff yeah. with your story and um, with the novel you're totally alone with the reader it's me yeah. and the reader and I'm telling a story to to a person and I have to think about every word every description I'm not a big fan of uh, long descriptions I like if the words are on point so um, it was I was working with the part uh, the description of the courtyard, for example, it took me uh, two weeks, <laughs> these three pages to describe it. Yeah. And if I uh, write a screenplay, I can write it's a Frankfurt 1963 courtyard. And the set designer looks up for f uh, photos, pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, he's building up the room. And I yeah. have to build the room by language. So yeah, that's it. the big difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think um, when I think about your uh, language, uh, I think you, ha you have such a sensitive eye with to language, and I guess that's because you have written scripts. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think know. So. <laughs> but but I, I think so. I think so, because if you are writing a dialogue, you really have to listen to what actually... Yes, of course. Uh, with yeah. the dialogue, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 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 yeah, because it, it can be actually easier to be sensitive, sensitive to language, but not sensitive to dialogue if you only write novels. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, but uh, when you, um, I, I guess you wanted to, uh, did you know you wanted to be an author or did you know you just enjoyed writing when you were younger? Uh, when I uh, read my first book from Astrid Lindgren, it was my biggest wish to become an author, of course. Yeah. And I always was, was interested in who wrote this book. I always took as a child the books like, who, where is the name? And I always was interested in this profession. And then I took this a very long way yeah. over screenwriting because I'm also a fan of uh, TV series and uh, films. So. It was okay, <laughs> but now now I reach my goals. So. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very happy that you, that you did. Um, when you think about uh, the background research um, for the novel, and then you must have read a lot of uh, documents about the trial. Uh, so, or did you? The no, it, uh, yes, it no. was much more. My most uh, source was uh, were the recording tapes yeah. of the trial. Um, about four hundred hours. It's all oh. documented. Yes, 
and that was the um, when the idea came up to write this yeah. novel. When I listened to this um, document, to these tapes, a lot of uh, a few uh, testimonies. Uh, I, I listened more and more again and again, and they are also in my book. They, a few of them. And there was uh, a, yeah. a Polish translator, a woman, and I was right. very impressed by her because she was so calm and and sure, and she helped the witnesses so much to tell the the horror of their traumatized in front of the um, offenders. So uh, yeah. um, these these tapes were my main inspiration because if you of course I read a few other books, but that was the, the main part. Okay. The yes. voices. Yeah. The voices. Um, what surprised you? Or was there something in the language people used in the trials that that surprised you, or or was different than, than what you were expecting? Um, there were a few um, who knew German, but they don't want to to talk in German, for example. But in Polish and so, because it was oh. the, um, the the language of the criminals, of course, yeah. German. Yeah. So that was the very difficult, uh, diff um, dedicate. No, I don't know the word. <laughs> I yeah. think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but uh, no surprises about the language, not but about um, Auschwitz because uh, I was always interested in the Holocaust, always reading, always watching, and I, I thought I uh, knew everything. But if you listen to these people who uh, had been there, yeah, then you begin to recognize that you know nothing about the, the hell it was. You have to listen. I can only recommend if you someone is. Um, Knows German, you should listen to this. Yeah. Uh, why do you? Th because also your TV shows uh, deal with the recent past. Um, why do you think it's important to write about the recent past, or why do you enjoy writing about it? Uh, I did not choose it. It came <laughs> only oh. just like that because uh, I I cannot write about what's happening around me because mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm it's. Too heavy for me to make a selection of what's uh, what is really important yeah. to see the important things. And if you go a, a little bit, um, take a distance to a yeah. story, you see what's what is relevant. But what uh, what uh, the interesting thing is, if you write about the past, it's always the same. When I'm writing about the past, I recognize at what one point that what I write is now. It's me. It's what I'm dealing with. For example, the Kudam stories was very much about uh, mother and uh, daughter relationship yeah. and it a ends with uh, uh, that the daughter leaves her mother and it's really really sad mm. and uh, I wrote this and then I noticed oh my my, my eldest daughter just yeah. left to Berlin and it was oh. very sad for me to yeah. to, to let her go, and and uh, I thought, okay, it's my story what I'm writing. For example, it's a yeah, yeah, small yeah. Uh, example, but it also happens in a bigger, bigger way, of course. Uh, this is also a great story um, about denial, because it seems like that all people are somehow in denial, more or less, or they don't want to talk about the recent past. Um, and uh, I also I started to I started to think if if denial as such is like a great uh, or not great but the sad tragedy of the hu humanity or human humankind or the world because it I mean we are living now again in some sort of denial I, or at least there are a lot of people who are in denial when it comes to the climate change for example. So I was just thinking that if if this story of denial is uh, what um, what can we learn about the past denial? I mean, this is a big question. I know, <laughs> and I'm sure there is no <laughs> easy answer to it. 
But I'm asking it anyway, so. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, uh, it's the topic of, of my book. I thought a lot about it. Um, so the question is, how much have you to deny to survive? Yeah. It's always yeah. this... Uh, and it was the same in the 50s after the war in Germany. I really understand why the, the most of the people denied the past, the, the crimes of the yeah. uh, Nazis, of themselves, of course. Yeah. Um, because uh, if they had began to work up it immediately, there, yeah. wasn't, there is, wouldn't be any Germany anymore yeah. today. Uh, they need uh, the power to build up the houses. So yeah. and, not, and not to talk about... Now, uh... <laughs> now uh, excuse your me. Voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? We're back. Okay. We are back. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Another part of the question because it's, it's totally interesting and um, I re what I really tried in the book not to judge the denying. Yeah. So that's the most important thing. Uh, to um, bring people to speak, <laughs> not to judge yeah. that they are silent. So, uh, to, uh, but to understand at first, and then say, and then ask, yeah, and then uh, create a room to talk. Yeah, so that's what I, I try. Um, I, I think Germans are very active, more active than many others when it comes to all kinds of activities um, um, with coming to terms with the recent past. Um, uh, how, how do you see it, you know, today? Um, how do you see German uh, and the history politics? Uh, I, I mean, for example, um, is the younger generation still thinking that uh, there needs to be, there's work to be done? Uh, is there a difference between the former Eastern Germany uh, and uh, Western Germany when it comes to the history of politics, for example? Yeah, um, you have to hold on and on and on with this work yeah. of remembrance, of course. And in the schools, there has been uh, questions about how many um, of the younger, under 20 year old, younger people, there are 40% in the schools, they don't know anything about the Holocaust, for example, yeah. 40%, that's very much, I think. And um, so you have to find other ways to tell them again and again about yeah. it. And the difference between Eastern and Western Germany is, for example, that the Eastern um, pupils were, were forced to go yeah. into a camp in, uh, um, um, and in, Germ in Western Germany and from the Western part, uh, it was, was, was free to, <laughs> to yeah. visit or not. So there was no, um, you weren't forced by school. Um, but uh, for example, the people coming to my readings, they are, uh, like 70 years old, always interested in uh, German history. Mm -hmm. And I'm sometimes a bit sad because they don't need my book. So, oh. <laughs> but the younger ones, they, they are uh, already humanist, human, humanistic. Uh, and um, it's hard to reach the younger people and to not over any voyeuristic things, you know, that's yeah. uh, also difficult not to use this horror to reach yeah. them. Yeah, and um, what, what um, well, because Germany uh, has been so active in, in coming to terms with the past and you have lots of tools, you have also learned a lot about coming to terms with the past. And one of the um, I don't know, perhaps surprising stories I've heard uh, is connected to North and Korea uh, because uh, those people who have managed to flee from North and Korean camps and they, they might be, you know, young people or older people who have lived throughout their whole life in the camps. So they don't actually know much about what's happening outside. And... Uh, 
what uh, the uh, NGOs who have been helping them, one of the initiatives was to take those uh, Northern Korean refugees to Auschwitz. And first mm -hmm. I was like, you know, wait a second, like these people have been living in, uh, in, in an Auschwitz kind, kind of camp for their yeah. whole life. And then you take, but it was something I, of course, because I'm uh, living in a different world, I couldn't uh, imagine their reaction. And their, their reaction was actually very positive to their mm -hmm. trip because for the first time they could see that the camp can become a museum mm. because they were brought up in a mm. situation where they thought that this will never end and they couldn't imagine that mm. and seeing the camp that has become a museum made them to understand that it can actually end and i think that was uh, this is one one of the uh, one of the stories uh, that tells why it's also important to talk about recent past, why it's important to have museums in the places where things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. have actually happened. And for them, it was actually a healing experience, mm. which was very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But what about... Uh, yeah, but what about really, uh, yeah. yeah, but um, what I wanted to say about this, who knows about Auschwitz uh, these days in Germany and what about the upworking, what is really um, horrible that um, it's about these 20% uh, of Nazis in the parliaments, in the European parliaments. I don't know how it is in Finland, but we have in Germany this AfD party. Yeah. And of course, they are... Um, talking they have uh, have a voice about the taxes and the taxes go in this Gedenkstätten holocaust yeah. uh, of course and they say no no money anymore for Sachsenhausen for example to uh, have it as a museum and that is that is really um, dangerous that they there's yeah. uh, from the um, from this side try to destroy this um, upworking of the yeah. past so, how is it in Finland about the right? Um, well, we do have a populist party, um, and um, um, well, ho Holocaust denial is not popular in Finland. Um, but um, we've had uh, neo Nazis. Um, I guess there have been a small group of them, like always like in every country mm. i think yeah okay yeah. um but uh, populistic parties they uh they have been losing their well, popularity um and uh, at present it looks like that they are not uh, they are not gaining popularity at the, at the moment okay mm. um, so um i, I think yeah. um mm. The one of the things that, for example, that media has understood the responsibility uh, as uh, um, as a messenger of facts and not fake news, and that they don't mm. need to report every single time when a populist has has tweeted something. I think that has also okay. kind of yeah. made made the difference. Mm. And also, uh, for example. Uh, hate speech was not a popular public topic before, but mm. over the past few years there has been a change, obviously, for better. I mean, it's yeah. it's something that okay. people are more aware of that it's a problem and why mm -hmm. it's a problem, yeah, for yeah. example. So I think there has been positive development and not, yeah. not to the... Of course, we don't know what the future brings, but I have a feeling that at least some people are trusting more science now with the pandemia then perhaps oh, okay that's true i hope that's so. the same in germany but yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. um but what about um let's get back to the uh your novel uh, um you have written uh tv shows but could you see yourself writing a script about the deutsches house 
or do you want to go back to your old old work no i'm uh, actually still <laughs> already working on it because uh, yeah. i have a lot of partners in production companies and they ask me oh you are writing a novel so <laughs> let us make a series out of it so yeah and i must say it it is written like a script it is built like a script it came from a concept i wrote for a series yeah. so it uh, would be easy for me to form it uh, into a um, series for example yeah. and i'm now i'm working on, on it uh, i one year i said no because for me it's great as i said before that every reader has it its own movie in his head yeah. when he is yeah. reading there are so many different movies and if i make the script or the series as one yeah everybody sees and you know of course how it is if you see your favorite novel on screen it's always yeah. a shock you can never uh, re reproduce the fantasy a reader has while reading so yeah it's all never better i think there are a few examples for, from adaptions from uh, yeah. novels where the the film is a better than the book but mostly it's other ways thing yeah but i'm doing i'm doing it now because um i want to reach more uh, more of these younger people this this is topic yeah. that's my reason um uh, how about the um movie industry in in germany um because well what we've learned uh since the me too movement is that uh women uh the minority when it comes to directing and screenwriting as well so how it is in germany even though i mean finland considers it's and i mean the level of equality in finland is very good compared to many other countries and yet uh there are not too many female screenwriters nor directors yet at the same time over 50% of the authors are actually female how many 50 uh, over 50% of authors wow yeah no, that, in, so in, yeah that's good but movie industry is totally di different so how uh, yeah. how is it in germany uh in in germany it's pure sadness <laughs> the oh. directors are the, there are eight female i'm working on it i'm in uh, a few initiatives about it to change it of course i hope it, but it's really sad yeah. still sad but how about you know when you think about the uh, movie schools because uh, the th uh, problem in finland is that um uh, when you think about the number of students then it's like you know 50% of the students are actually female so when they the get out of the, the movie even books, more it's same in germany yeah. as well yeah. okay so it's yeah. in the structures it's in the structures yeah absolutely they don't come through yeah but i believe that you know the more we have interesting female characters also on screen like you know characters you are creating for example so um that will make the change yes i mean there must so. be a change yeah yeah well i think it's now it's time to wrap things up unless is is there is there for example um a tv show you could recommend to or what what's uh, a tv show you admire as a screenwriter oh oh that's you know difficult. from the professional uh, I, perspective uh, Oh, uh, I, I'm very special. I'm watching old movies from the '70s. Uh, crime series was very. Uh -huh. I think it has has been in Finland too because it was all over the world. It's Derek with such an old uh, okay. commissar. Have you heard about it? Yeah, 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 Derek, yeah, 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 yeah. From the '70s, '80s, and it was sold to Korea, for example, uh -huh. or no, South North Korea, or South no, or China and. Um, because i always want to watch things uh, 
while I'm thinking about what are they doing there and how could I make it better and so it's ah. um, I'm not watching like a normal person so you um, have lost but your I like yeah yes of yeah. course yeah 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 that's <laughs> sometimes I I miss the days of innocent reading and uh, TV shows yes, are much more cool. innocent I don't write scripts yeah. so they yeah. I still have a little bit of innocence mm -hmm. left there Yeah. Oh, okay. but unfortunately oh. I'm less innocent when I'm breathing but oh. um, thank you for this excellent novel yeah. and I trust that we will get a new novel soon I hope yes excellent I wrote and perhaps, perhaps uh, okay. then uh, you'll come to Finland and oh, yes. can meet I would love in, to. Real, I in would real life to. yeah so Thank you for joining yeah. us. Uh, stay safe and you enjoy too. your Thank writing you days. Thank you too. Okay. Was Bye. It was very nice. Bye. Thank you. No need. That was Annette Hess. If you haven't read her book, then do. Uh, kiitoksia kaikille, jotka olitte täällä mukana seuraamassa haastattelua Annette Hessin kanssa. Uh, kirja on ihana, niin kuin jo sanoin, yksi suosikkeani tästä uh, tältä vuodelta. Uh, käännöskirjallisuudessa muitakin suosikkeja on ollut paljon ja niistä tullaan kyllä puhumaan tässä vielä ennen joulua. Ja sitten myöskin ajattelin, että, uh, uh, että mitä mitä kirjasopassa voitaisiin tehdä ennen joulua, niin yksi asia, jota ainakin jota haluan tehdä täällä, on erilaisia konvehteja, koska konvehtithan on hirvittävän helppoja ja kivoja tehdä. Uh, niitä osaa tehdä ihminen, joka ei välttämättä muuten kokkailisikaan, ja uh, olen test testauttanut erästä uutta konvehtireseptiä myöskin ystävälläni, joka piti niistä kovasti. Ja Uh, jos teille tulee jotain aiheideoita tai muita sellaisia juttuja, joita, joita uh, haluatte, että tässä kirjasopassa nyt tässä ennen joulua käsitellään, niin laittakaa viestiä ja kommentteja ja sen sellaista. Voikaa hyvin ja yritetään selvitä tästä vähemmän miellyttävästä vuodesta eteenpäin jouluhan. Minä aion ainakin ottaa kaiken irti joulusta, koska joulu tuo nyt ainakin tähän kirteyttä tähän tilanteeseen, jossa nyt ollaan. Joten pysyttäkää terveillä, luetaan asioita ja katsotaan vaikka TV-sarjaa. Hei hei!